any better? A little better. Attorney Guerriero, are you able to ch change the mixer on your on your sound? If you click on the, the sound icon, is that if you increase your sound, would that make it better for us to hear you? We could turn our sound way up and just have to turn it back down when they when somebody else speaks. You know what I mean? Oh, when he's talking? Yeah. We can try that. I mean, you know, do you have the remote? Leanna does. Or maybe turn up the volume when he talks. But then we'll have to turn it down for some because it's really loud. We'll have to turn it down for some because it's really loud. All right, I think somebody has. Can you hear me okay? I hear a little bit of um. Can you hear me, Clerk Carlson? I can, thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. Can you reduce his volume now? So, Attorney Chase, could you say something? Just make sure we can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Barron, can you hear us okay? Yes, I, I can hear you. Thank you. Attorney Gary Yarrow, did you waive a reading of the complaints? Yes, I've reviewed those with Ms. Barron. Thank you very much. with everybody except the person speaking. I think in order to make this work, everybody needs to be muted except when you're speaking. I don't know which one, of course. Right, so can you Good afternoon. This is a arraignment and bail hearing in the matter of State of New Hampshire versus Brittany Barron, at which all parties appear by WebEx. Uh, would counsel for the state identify yourself, please? Scott Chase for the state, Your Honor. And would counsel for the defendant identify yourself? 
Your Honor, Richard Guerriero for Ms. Barron. Okay, and um, Ms. Barron, have you been able to hear everything that I've said and that the attorneys have said so far? Ms. Barron, can you hear me? Yes, Your Honor. And we, were you able to hear the two attorneys just now? Um, not completely. You did not hear the attorneys? It was a little distorted, but I could hear the voices, yes, Your Honor. Okay, you can hear me though, right? Yes, I can. Okay, let me just uh, have attorney Chase identify himself again. Let's make sure you can hear him. Attorney Chase. Scott Pitts for the state, Your Honor, and also here is Benjamin Gotti for the state. And I think we're actually getting feedback maybe from Attorney Guerriero's um, connection, but I'm not sure. Or now it's muted. It's it's better now. Say your name again and we'll see if Ms. Barron heard that. Uh, Scott Chase for the state of New Hampshire. Uh, Ms. Barron, were you able to hear Attorney Chase just now? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, and now Attorney Guerrero, would you identify yourself again? Yes, Your Honor, Richard Guerrero for Ms. Barron. And Ms. Barron, were you able to hear your attorney just now? Yes, I was, Your Honor. Okay, if at any time during this hearing you can't hear either me or any of the attorneys or anyone else speaking, let me know and we'll do what we can to solve that problem. Uh, Attorney Guerrero, do you, does your client waive a reading of the three complaints and plead not guilty? That's correct, Your Honor. I reviewed them with her just before this call. Okay, very good. I'll note her pleas of not guilty to all three charges of falsifying physical evidence. Attorney Chase, what's the state recommending for bail and the reasons for the recommendation? Your Honor, the state is asking for preventative detention. While the state recognizes that the defendant has been cooperative and has assisted investigators, this case is especially heinous and gruesome. The brutality of the crime combined with the fact that the defendant's destruction of evidence was in an effort to conceal a capital murder is especially alarming and concerning for the safety of the general public. Beyond just cleaning up physical evidence in the victim's car, after driving Jonathan's body nearly 200 miles north of the crime scene in Jonathan's own car, Deep into the North Woods, the defendant decapitated Jonathan, wrapped his head in a tarp, and placed it in a grave in order to prevent investigators from identifying Jonathan if his body was ever found. The defendant then wrapped Jonathan's body in a tarp and dragged him deeper into the woods where investigators found him in a shallow brook. This was all with the intent to conceal a capital murder. Had this defendant successfully destroyed that evidence, her husband, the alleged murderer, may very well have evaded detection and or apprehension. And currently, Your Honor, the investigation is ongoing. Evidence is still being collected and processed. If released, there are no guarantees that this defendant will not attempt to further conceal or destroy any other evidence. And for those reasons, Your Honor, in the facts in the affidavit, there is clear and convincing evidence that releasing the defendant will endanger the safety of another person or the public. And accordingly, the state again requests that the court order preventative detention. Attorney Guerrero. Yes, Your Honor. Um, you'll forgive me if I am um, not perfectly organized. I found out about this case at about 1.15 and literally had time to read the affidavit once and to talk to Ms. Barron for about 15 minutes. But I do have quite a bit to say, having just um, conducted that preliminary inquiry. And I will tell you that although there are very few cases like this at which um, I start with the weight of the evidence, I think that's where we start on the bail factors here. Um, and it, it, I think if you look in particular at the affidavit at pages four and five, you will see that um, in everything that the state alleges that Miss Barron did, she did under duress, and I mean under duress, meaning direct fear from her for her life 
after having been beaten, according to the New Hampshire State Police account of this in, in their interview with her. Um, if you look at page four, um, this really started with her being beaten severely. If you look at her face right now, to the extent that you can see it, she still has the bruising on her face and around her eyes, and it's described in the affidavit. Um, Armando uh, beat her severely and threatened her. Um, he put a gun in her mouth an obvious threat to kill her. He applied enough force to her neck to make it difficult for her to breathe to the point that she passed out um, and chipped her tooth in the incident. She was, to say the least, severely threatened, severely beaten, and placed in fear of her life. The conduct that she is accused of is conduct that she engaged in after having been ordered, according to the affidavit submitted to this court, to engage in that conduct by Armando. I mean, if you look on pages four and five, there's no less than um, half a dozen times where it refers to her being ordered. And in spite of being, uh, being ordered under that duress to participate in, in some respects in this conduct, not willfully, but having to do what she was made to do under with fear for her own life um, when she was threatened and ordered to harm the victim she refused uh, two times uh, so to say that um, she is acting willfully and acted in anything other than under duress I think is wrong uh, and the state's own evidence confirms that. Um, that, of course, is from her statement to the police, and I'm sure that's what their response would be. But what they also cannot dispute and that they would have to testify directly to is that she then not only provided a statement, but cooperated fully and led to the discovery of evidence, um, which ended up in Armando being arrested. In plain English, she helped solve this crime and rather than conceal evidence or falsify evidence, she led the police directly to evidence. Um, she was beyond cooperative. I, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine being beaten like that, threatened with your life in this situation, and being fearful, and then cooperating with the police. And yet, that's what she did by, by the account of the police. So, to say that she's, um, that the weight of the evidence is significant here is the opposite of what the state has presented. Her injuries were uh, confirmed by a trip to the hospital and by the testimony of the um, state troopers. When you add the, the fact that they don't have a lot of weight of evidence regarding these three charges, the fact that she's not accused of violence against any person, and uh, that she's cooperated. And then you look at her personal background. To my knowledge, she has no prior criminal record. She's been a resident of New Hampshire for the past six years. She's been living in Jaffrey and employed. Our proposal would be that she be released on electronic monitoring and continue to live at the same address in Jaffrey um, at 63 Main Street. We would agree to any reasonable conditions of that release. I would note that she has a minor child that um, is obviously involved in this case. That child needs her mother. She is a nine-year-old daughter. Um, and there's simply not a good reason to detain her here when you think about um, the, the factors that we look at. Is she going to show up for court? Obviously, and electronic monitoring will ensure that she shows up and that we know where she is. Is she a threat to the community? There's no evidence whatsoever that she's a threat to the community. The evidence is that she's a victim who cooperated with the police. So our position is that she should be released on personal recognizance bail with a special condition of electronic monitoring uh, uh, under the supervision of the Cheshire County House of Corrections. Okay, thank you. Attorney uh, Chase, your reply? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> There's no doubt, um, and the state does not deny, that there is substantial evidence that the defendant was assaulted um, by her husband, Armando. Um, however, there, and while there are factors surrounding her crime that may have impacted her decision to commit those crimes, those factors were taken into consideration when the state evaluated what charges to seek, and more importantly, are factors that are for a jury to consider in determining her guilt not in determining her threat to the community. For example, um, defense counsel said that there was no evidence of violence. Um, there was evidence that she used a knife from a machete to cut the victim's wrists um, or hands after he was 
um, kidnapped or forced into the car at gunpoint. Again, those charges weren't brought out of consideration for the facts and circumstances surrounding the incident. Um, however, to discount the fact that the defendant drove nearly 200 miles in a separate vehicle with a cell phone on her person um, in transporting the body for three and a half hours approximately, Your Honor, with multiple opportunities anywhere in between um, fringe and um, the scene of the of her crimes uh, demonstrates that she had multiple opportunities to avoid committing the crimes that she is currently charged with. Um, the crime, another example of that is the steering wheel itself. Her cleaning that steering wheel was um, after Armando, as Your Honor can see in the affidavit, had gone to destroy other evidence. Um, beyond that, Your Honor, she did cooperate. She cooperated after she was caught. She had multiple opportunities prior to being caught by New Hampshire Fishing Game to um, seek help, to avoid, regardless of, you know, in addition to the 200 miles that she drove and had the opportunity to um, uh, prevent herself from, from feeling like she needed to, to commit any of the crimes. The incident of hunters, um, you know, three different times or at least twice where she had opportunities with those hunters um, to say, I need help. Armando wasn't there. It was her and the victim's body. And she did nothing to alert um, the hunters or any authorities that she needed help. Um, but instead, she continued to participate um, in an effort to conceal evidence to prevent the discovery of that evidence. And again, we're talking about in a crime of capital murder, in a heinous crime, she was um, will, participating in hiding, destroying, or concealing evidence that could have prevented the detention from an alleged murderer which is the most dangerous situation that could have happened is if he failed to be apprehended or charged with these crimes because there was no evidence. So the fact that the case is ongoing, the fact that evidence is continuing to be discovered and to be processed is support for the clear and convincing evidence that she is a danger to the public. Attorney Guerrero, uh, anything further? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I just want to point out that um, not only had she been threatened um, with a gun in her mouth and beaten severely and ordered by Ormondo to participate in this conduct of destroying evidence, concealing evidence, um, depending on what aspect of it you're looking at. Um, Armando, in fact, had access to her daughter and later did have custody of their daughter. So beyond fearing for her own life, even after she was left alone, she had no idea what else he was going to go do. And I would point out that there's no allegation of any violence that she engaged in that was not under the direct duress. And I mean direct duress in the sense of being threatened with death uh, after having been beaten, uh, direct duress from Armando. Uh, I simply don't see how the state can say that they've carried their burden by clear and convincing evidence or demonstrated that she's a danger to the community. Electronic monitoring will be more than sufficient to uh, ensure that the, the jail knows where she is. They protected the community. There's no evidence of any other violence of any other kind in her life. There's no evidence of other instability in the form of drug use or other criminal record. There's no evidence of any failure to appear. There's simply no reason to deprive this woman who is presumed to be innocent of her freedom at this point. Your Honor, if I may make one more point. You may. Your Honor, as you can see in the affidavit, when Armando, the individual who defense counsel is claiming was um, directing all of the defendant in this case's actions, when he left her in the woods with the body, with the evidence, he left her with two firearms. When, when law enforcement found her, she had a loaded 9 millimeter handgun on her person. She did not make any effort to defend herself or the evidence of the crime. She was armed with two firearms. She had complete opportunity to notify others to seek help to avoid um, um, Armando coming into contact with her children, both when she was driving the 200 miles up north she could have called authorities she could have pulled into authorities she could have flagged somebody down on the road there's there's numerous opportunities for her to ins have ensured that armando was not going to have contact with her children beyond that yet again when she had the opportunity when she was in the woods she had firearms to defend herself she took no action to defend herself to alert authorities or to help the situation at all um, so again based upon all of that and the totality of the circumstances um, by clearing convincing evidence, she is a threat to the public 
um, if she is released, Your Honor. Your Honor, can I just make one new point? I don't want to take up your time here, but it, see, there's not an obligation to report a crime, and there's certainly not an obligation to report it when you've been threatened with death and beaten. She had no, I mean, it, she's just simply not obligated. I mean, I know the state wishes she had done that, but she was not obligated to do that, and frankly, her fear is totally understandable. Okay, well, having considered the allegations in the uh, probable cause affidavit, the each party's arguments and offers of proof, and all relevant circumstances under the bail statute, at least at this time, I do agree with the state that it is established by clear and convincing evidence that the defendant's release will endanger the safety of the public. So I am going to grant the request for preventative detention at this time. Anything further, counsel? See you, Your Honor. Not at this time, Your Honor. Okay, very good. Then this matter is concluded. Thank you, Your Honor.